I'm Sherry Wetmarsh. I'm the managing director of the Cherrywood Art Fair, and I've been involved with Chu League, the nonprofit that puts it on since 2009 when I joined the board. Um, as of last month, I am no longer a board person, but I am still involved very much with this event, and I'm um, saying howdy. <laughs> so I think that sometimes people really don't know who puts on the Cherrywood Art Fair because it happens at an elementary school. There's some perception it might be a PTA event or something you know like that but Chula League um, is the nonprofit that puts it on our, our mission is to uh, ensure that the arts and public outdoor spaces play a valued role in the educational economic and cultural well-being of East Austin neighborhoods we started out in the Cherrywood neighborhood um, but we now go by our short name Chula League because of the fact that we serve the whole East Side with our programs um, the, the big programs that we do, of course, is the flagship event, the Chairwood Art Fair, and a very important arts mentoring program called Little Artists, Big Artists, that really the fair um, supports directly. Um, so that's kind of like a little visual integration of Chula as the producer and our two programs. Our short mission is that we support the arts, art education, and artful outdoor spaces in East Austin. And a little history on the art fair. Um, it, it is a very beloved art shopping event. Like, like Blue Genie, it's definitely about shopping and gifts. Um, but the, I think one of the differentiators is that it's a very um, festival atmosphere. We, it's, it's a weekend. Uh, it's always the second weekend in December. Um, and it has a very family-friendly atmosphere. Um, there's live music, there's kids' craft activities, there's multiple kids' activities, actually. There's a huge silent auction that includes the little artists who have made things during their program that is auctioned off at the art fair, and that those proceeds go right back to their art school. Um, and then every artist that applies for the fair also donates something in the auction. So it's, it's a, a huge auction. And then we also have food trucks. We have six to eight food trucks um, and food vendors. So it's like definitely one of those you can do something for the whole family when you come there and we get all ages and types of shoppers that, that come. Um, in addition to supporting the Chula's Little Artist Big Artist program, we also actually do give pretty significant grants to Maplewood Elementary and we support both their art and their gardening program to support the sort of urban landscape roots of our nonprofit. Um, and uh, really since 2005 when we became a nonprofit, um, we have given over $104,000 in grants and services and programming to East Austin neighborhoods and elementary schools. So we're proud of that and you know we're proud of what the art fair, how that makes those things happen. Um, here's a little visual history of our posters since the beginning. Um, last year was our 15th year and so, uh, you know, we've, we've had really strong branding, I think, right, right from the beginning, actually. Because Maplewood is a mid-century school, there's been a bit of a retro theme to a lot of our graphics um, and our branding. Um, we've, starting with um, 2006 in the bottom left corner, that artist, same artist who was an art fair artist, did the illustrations um, all the way through the, actually the 2012, that car with the the, the uh, art supplies coming out of that was her too, Melissa Gable. And then since then we've used um, an artist from the art fair to do sort of the central illustration in combination with a, a designer or an art director. Um, and I think that's been a nice way to kind of promote an artist in the art fair and also, you know, mix it up. Like we're, we're for kind of keeping it fresh and keeping the graphics different. We don't go with a corporate look. You know, we did for a while with the same logo, but our, our new policy is to kind of mix it up every year. Um, actually, going back to that, there was some things I was going to touch on that, that have changed since the beginning. So in the beginning, we, there was just 10 artists um, putting on the, the event. Um, by the 10th anniversary, we were up to 114. Um, we really kind of expanded the layout that year. And then we decided that, you know, that was good for the 10th anniversary, but we would kind of keep it down about 85, and that's that's been pretty much the average um, for the last four, four years or so, four or five years. 
Um, so as I said, the nonprofit formed in 2005, three years into being an art fair. We saw the, you know, the ability to give grants and do things like that, so we became a nonprofit. Um, and in 2013, we also really mixed up the programming to add community partners to the fair. So those partners get booths um, on, outside in our basketball court um, where the music is as well, and they do ki kids' activities and things like that. So it's, you know, we've had uh, the Texas Roller Girls, we've had Co-op Radio, we've had, um, uh, you know, uh, Oh, I'm blanking on their name. Oh, Sustainable Food Center. We've had you know all kinds of things, but we really encourage them to have like an activity, not just handing out literature. Um, and so it's really been kind of a nice opportunity that we get to help even more nonprofits in the community be a part of the fair. Um, the branding, as I said, is pretty strong and um, something we're proud of. We give packets of posters and flyers and postcards to our artists to help spread the word on the event. We also do things like that top right family fun flyer. Since we do have a lot of different kind of programming happening at the fair, we tailor it to our audiences. This is just a sampling of the different things we've done from social media to paid um, ads to uh, the bottom right is the Austin Chronicle has been a really good media sponsor for us. We had uh, a number of ads with them last year. Um, and you know some some special things just from the music lineup so there's a lot going on there um, and just to give you a sort of a top level like we we really do push our paid and media sponsorships and extend them we had you know s over six million um, impressions with the different channels that we reached this year and one of the big things that we did that was new this past year was we got a commercial slash PSA made um, that we're really proud of because that was like a big, big step for us to have that. And uh, I'm going to just, sh it's short, so I'm going to play that for you. What Chula League is doing for the Maplewood School, they are developing new artists. I work with this uh, little artist named Carolina. And they're actually supporting these kids so they can sell art at the following year's fair gives kids another opportunity to see the world from a different angle, that you can be a creative person and still find a way to be successful. These artists are local artists from Austin. There's a sort of vintage um, thing about the school. People from the elementary school and people from the neighborhood. It's just a really cool way to see everyone from Austin, all around Austin. I want everybody to feel really special when they're part of this. And I think to do that, you have to be part of the community. It's like completely a community event. This is my little artist yeah. right here. Time to celebrate an East Austin holiday shopping tradition. You can eat, shop, and play at Chula League's Cherrywood Art Fair. This beloved event offers Austin's favorite food trucks, an eclectic selection of high-quality Texas goods, engaging family fun activities, and live music. Cherrywood Art Fair supports Chula's Little Artist, Big Artist Mentoring Program, connecting professional artists with elementary school students. For more details on this year's fair, please visit cherrywoodartfair.org. I just want to share that. Another new thing that we did last year that was really popular and um, pretty fabulous. I think Blue Genie had a picture of um, Pigsy Arts booth. Uh, Brandy is a board member and she made those fabulous laser cut awards and we had a Critics' Choice and a Audience Choice Best Booth Award. And uh, Illuminated Objects was the winner of the Critics' Choice on the left and Garzik Design was the winner of the uh, audience choice on the right and they got to display that and plug it on social media and it was it was a fun addition that I think we're gonna do every year cuz why not <laughs> um, all right well let me tell you a little bit about the artist application um, we are going to open that up for 2017 and July 1st and that will be available at the um, sort of reduced fee of $25 to just apply through the 15th and then we have a period there until September 1st where it goes up um, to a little higher fee. Um, and again, those fees go right 
right towards our programming. You know, that's it's really all just raising money for a little artist, big artist. Um, the booth fees are very, from from what I hear from um, people in the know, they're very reasonable um, for this this kind of show, for such a popular show that has such a big audience for the weekend. Um, I gave you sort of some insider information on the right on how many booths are available at each of those levels. Um, you can see that those indoor booths are definitely smaller numbers and we routinely get way more people that want to be indoors than outdoors because of the potential of weather in December. Um, but there are other people that just love to be outdoors because it's the first thing <laughs> that you know the, the, the people shopping obviously see. Um, so that's what those cost. We have these, I think it's 10 categories that you apply in and We've uh, honed these over the last couple of years, and we feel like this is a good representation of categories. What we would say for people that um, are perhaps have work that might cross different categories is pick the category that is, you know, the the that showcase the most of what you sell or the bulk of what your work is. Pick that category, and when it comes to uh, entering your three photos to apply for the fair, pick photos that show just that. Don't be tempted to kind of show the other things that you might do as well, because it tends to confuse, especially if it doesn't fall in that category, because as when we get to the point where I talk about the jury process, like they are really judging you against other artists in your category. Now, if, you're, if you strongly feel like you want to be judged and rated in the two different categories that you might have in your booth, you're absolutely welcome to do that. You would just have to pay the application fee to apply in multiple categories. And you know, routinely we get four or five artists that choose to do that because they really want to be considered both ways. Um, to give you a little breakdown again, some sort of behind the scenes information. This is the starting on the, the right side. This is over the last uh, five, six years. The, num the total fair artists and the breakdown by category. Um, that first column that's highlighted in yellow, that's how many applicants we got. So for last year when we had 90 spots, or we had 88 booths, but a couple of them were shared, um, for those 90 artists that we ultimately let in, we had 241 applicants. So you can see that it is a very popular <laughs> um, event. But you can also see, and I really hope you pay some attention to this, if this applies to you, there are certain categories like photography like kids and pets that don't get the, the mass numbers of applicants. And it's a real opportunity for people that sell things in that genre to get into the fair, to get into a very competitive fair, <laughs> if that's something that, that you do um, and can you know, apply in those categories. So um, that's some good information to have. Um, in terms of application tips, are as I said, we have three photos that you submit to be rated. When you do the application, you submit those three photos. It's a blind jury. So we have instructions when you're uploading those photos to use like an anonymous ID that we assign and do a good job of not putting your business name and titles and captions, um, which does happen. Um, but the jurors only see those three images, those image titles and captions, and your category. They don't see your business name, they don't see your website. Um, as I said earlier, the, you know, the images submitted should represent the bulk of your work, what you sell most. Um, our opinion, and I've heard some different discussions on this today, but our, my opinion from looking at jury scores and actually doing this long enough to kind of know the artist's work, that, that artists that pick close-up individual product shots over further back kind of multiple product things, they tend to get better scores, especially if they're professionally shot and well lit and all that. I'm gonna show you in a moment some examples, some, some highly rated um, artist photos. Um, I talked about the two categories. So, you know, it's it, like I said, enter the products that match your category, but this is not a fair that we will penalize you if you have a variety of artwork at your booth. Um, you just got to remember your, your categories and you're found on the website through that category. So we want the bulk of what you have at your booth to be what you got into the show for. 
But if you sell something else that supplements that, that's fine. You can have that in your booth as well. We don't have a problem with that. Um, due to like sort of a request from the artist coordinator and some feedback in our artist surveys, we're going to add a fourth photo this year. So it will be an optional because we have a lot of emerging artists that don't necessarily have a pass booth, but they're going to be able to show a booth setup shot. And I think by having that as a fourth photo that the juror does not look at, the jury does not look at, it will actually help because sometimes people will use that as one of their three photos and we've always felt like that was a waste <laughs> because the jurors, I just don't, they don't know how to rate that kind of shot where it's backed up. Like what are they rating? How nice the booth is? Like the overall product in it? It just doesn't work for a jury type thing. So this, this actually gives you an opportunity to branch out a bit. So as I said, these are um, a series of examples of some really nice um, product photography for artists that have gotten into the fair. Um, you can see that the, the more singular shot is working, but um, you know, I think this is a good example of this artist here wanted to not just show the cover, but show how it looks when it's flat, show how it has a nice inside. Like, I think that's fine. Like, it's still basically one product that's being featured in that photo. It's just kind of giving you a little more information about what's happening with that. <laughs> And then I think that, you know, again, like sometimes doing an interesting uh, prop, like you'll see in the top right for Bea Moore with her, you know, because she does this whole bee inspired thing to have the honeycomb in there, um, really sets off her jewelry. Um, the, the bottom left, um, lemon glaze, I mean, she's got a few products in there, but it's definitely tight enough in and there's something featured in the beginning. The middle one on the bottom has you know, more of that merchandise look where there's a few things, but again, you can still really clearly see what they're selling and you get a feel for the different kinds of products. And, and then the bottom right for, um, it's Fed, Fedos. Yeah, Fedo, thank you. So that does that. I mean, that's a perfectly good way to, you know, she, she obviously didn't want to waste like one slide for one, <laughs> one thing when she does a whole bunch of different soap products. So that works, that's fine. That's a good way to do it as well. So. The main thing is to have well-lit, really clear um, product shots where it's, where it's clear what you're applying for. Um, so this is just a little excerpt from the online application. Um, as I was mentioning, um, the jurors see that image title when they hover over your um, image photos. And so including you know, good description. If, if it's an artwork piece, you know, all the kind of standard thing you would list in a, in a gallery show. But if it's a product and it's something that was handcrafted, like size, materials, and you know, things like that will be, um, they, it helps kind of when the jurors are trying to decide bef between two perhaps similar artists, it helps to see the extra information there. And you know, once you're in the show and accepted, those images are used. There's a featured image that's submitted as well. This is the very bottom of our homepage where we have a photo carousel um, that shows every artist in the show. And you can hover over them and see their name and click on it and go to their artist page. This is that top level 2016 artist that also gets filtered and sorted by category. Or once again, you can click on the featured image and go to their page. And then the, here's an example of what like an individual artist page. So there's you know, multiple ways that you're promoted on the site when you're there. You'll notice I did a little circle <laughs> in the um, description of her photo because she kind of made a little faux pas there to actually say her business name in the description. Sure, it's fine on the, on the web page, but we prefer that we really do keep it a blind jury process and that you not use your business name, which we say on the application, but you know, it happens. So, um, so yeah, but you can see each of those little um, photos that are down here at the bottom. When you click on them, they basically come up here in, in place of them. So you get to see all the different images that you've submitted um, for the application. So our jurors are usually a three panel juror group. Um, they change each year. Um, last year we had some real heavy hitters. They're all, you know, respected members of the local arts community. Um, Asa Hirsch is the, was the executive director of Art Alliance Austin. I think he just left town for another gig. But um, Jennifer Perkins 
is actually um, a, many years ago a past chair with Art Fair Artist, so she hasn't been doing the shows for a while, but she's done some uh, work with HTTV. Uh, Michael Sieben is a very well-respected illustrator, skateboard artist designer, the editor of Thrasher Magazine. He was also a big artist in our big artist program, so he really kind of had a sensitivity to our um, nonprofit and our programming. Um, since they're just looking at these anonymous photos of your work and comparing them to everyone else in the category, they'll, they'll do a rating under each of those photos, and I'll show you a screen in a second. Those ratings, along with sort of some overarching criteria to have a good media balance, a certain percentage of new artists each year, um, those, are, those are the kind of the overarching con uh, considerations for the final selection in the show. Um, I kind of reiterated that it's a hard job for them because they have all those applicants to narrow down to 86 booths. Um, we are one of the shows that really do encourage, it, encourage new and emerging artists. It kind of goes hand in hand with our mentoring of young fifth and sixth grade artists. We really like to encourage new artists to, to apply. So, you know, we had 58% of those 241 applicants were new artists last year. And 45% of them were actually selected to get into the show. So it really is a good opportunity um, for emerging artists. So this is what the um, juror, the private jury login site looks like. Um, we have all the categories there. We have the pictures, how many photos they have to look at in each category. And then they'll pull up a category and we have like instructions on, you know, our, our suggested methods for how they should get to the point of voting. Um, but it, it kind of works like Netflix. If you've ever rated a movie on Netflix, we have these five stars under there and they just hover over it and they drop and that's how they cast the vote. And the things in red at the bottom are what we sort of say to consider when they're casting those votes. You know, reserve your five stars for the most exceptional people that you really want to make sure get into the show. Um, you know, and then kind of go down from there in terms of what you're seeing in artwork. Because it's three jurors, and then they're all doing this independently, it is very much the opinion of the jurors that, in the end, the three different jurors, I mean, we've seen all over the place, you know, multiple times, like, one artist getting completely different ratings from the three different jurors. And, you know, we just average it out. Um, and that's the way it goes. But it's also good to consider the fact it's a new jury every year, you know, and you might not get in one in year and you get in the next or vice versa. You get in one year with one jury and then the next jury, for some reason, you know, doesn't score you as high. It's a little subjective that way. Um, but there is that caption I was talking about is right here. And this, is a, this artist, not to single them out, but it's probably a good example of somebody doing lifestyle photos but maybe having, uh, and then these are cropped, you know, they're just square. You can obviously click on them and see the full uncropped image. But maybe having a little bit of a challenge for the jurors to know what they're judging there. What is the product in that photo? So if you read that caption, there is some information there, and that helps. <laughs> but it is something to keep in mind if you're going to do those. And I've seen nice lifestyle photos, don't get me wrong, but... You, you, you need to make sure that, <laughs> that it's very clear <laughs> what is being presented in there for, for this kind of jury um, process. So, um, so after the jurors have done their part and we've averaged their scores, we pass it on to our artist coordinator, who is um, a staff member that um, is a paid staff member and you know, has a lot of training and a lot of background on the arts. And we also give the, her this kind of clear marching orders of these overarching things. Because in reality, you can't just pick the top 86 rated artists and put them in the show. There's considerations on booth selection. There's consideration on we can't have 20 ceramic artists, even if the 20 ceramic artists got the top scores. You know, So there's other things that you have to look at beyond the jury voting. Um, they have to meet our minimum, these first two bullets are our minimum criteria to even be um, accepted. Um, we, we definitely do not do imports, we do not do, I mean it's fine like other people have been saying about if you 
create some art and then you do digital printing or you do something to reproduce it, that's fine. But beyond that, we, we want to make sure that this is handcrafted. We make a lot, of, a lot of our PRs all about it being unique handcrafted items. Um, the, um, the balance of media categories is really important when we're creating our booth map to make sure that we don't have the same categories side by side or even across from each other. Um, and, you know, like I said earlier, we do have a mandate with our event to make sure we have at least 20% new artists. Um, we also look at sharing preferences and some people just put the same booth. You have two on the application, you have two choices for your booth preference. Some people put the same booth in both choices and says to us they're not really interested in another <laughs> option while other people will pick different things. In the end, we still will sometimes offer a booth that isn't the location they asked for just because we really want to see them in the show. And we'll wait to, for them to tell us that, no, that's not going to work. So we look at that too. It's a lower criteria though. And then the final thing is, will, you know, will this artwork fit in? Will it sell at the fair? And that's kind of similar to what other folks said about, you know, if, if the price point's too high, you know, it's pretty family oriented, will they just not have any sales or, you know, just other considerations um, like that. But that's, again, lower on the list. Um, so the artist coordinator has these sort of detailed um, sections of the booth map that are just with numbers. And then in her first pass, she goes in and plugs in names and types so she can do that kind of, she and the people that are kind of checking this work can see, okay, has she done a good job of balance and um, making sure that, that we're getting the right blend. And so this whole thing is done for the whole map. And then in the end, this is our you know, final booth map. This is sort of the artist version of it where we track things like all these dotted lines here are the traffic flow. Um, we also try to show what, how we want you to put the sort of the fronts of your booths. Um, so that you can kind of do your display um, according to what we think is going to be the best flow for the fair. Um, we have load-in information on this and, um, and other details like that um, for people to see. And let's see here. I think that's about that. Um, So yeah, um, the um, successful artist booths at the fair follow some tips and lots of resources that we post on um, a password protected area called the Artist Corner. Um, we also have a, an artist mixer. Um, it's really not a full-fledged orientation. It's much more of a social event, but we hold it in October. Um, the CAFS Cherry Wood Art for staff is there, the fellow <coughs> artists are there, they can get all their printed promo materials at it and ask questions. Um, we ask that in addition to all the promotions that we're doing that art fair artists do their own um, tagging of the events on social media so we can cross post. Um, you know, suggestions to, to post to our wall about what's going on and tag yourself. Um, and then because we give, we print like 25,000 postcards, that's our biggest um, number that we print. You know, we ask you, don't, you know, just mail these to the, your customers. Also, you know, bring them to your favorite coffee shop, you know, your restaurant, your food truck, things like that. So that you can really kind of spread the, re spread the word in your communities. Um, and if you have some kind of newsletter or email promo, you know, we love to see you do something there as well. Um, so the Artist Corner has um, all these categories of information that you can find here. There's lots of resources um, with links. There's information on the auction donations, on artist FAQs, um, booth setup, parking. Um, that is available just as soon as you are accepted into the fair to see all these resources. And um, we, we have sort of common sense tips for the best successful booths once you're at the show. Um, it's, it's always a good idea. We, we really see some anxious shoppers Saturday morning. <laughs> when we have a lot of people that show up right at the start of it at 10 a.m. So if you can be ready a little early. Um, 
since we do have a lot of outdoor booths and, and the weather is questionable sometimes, um, especially with wind, um, you need to definitely, if you have an outdoor booth, have heavy weights. When you leave on that Saturday night, you need to lower your tent as far as possible. Um, bringing, we have very limited electricity in the school, and obviously the outdoor artists don't have any of that. Um, and even some parts of the hallways and things are pretty dark. So bringing battery-operated lights. Um, if you're outside, bringing space heaters and hand warmers, the kind you can get at like sporting good stores for hunting and things. Those are really lifesavers when it's cold. Um, you know, again, we, we expect people to d do the same kind of tips everybody's been sharing on, you know, branding your whole booth display. Um, you know, you do things on the floors, on the tent walls, on the ceiling, you know, have every aspect show your style. Um, and, you know, it's a, a, a kind of a, I think you've heard it now multiple times, but the booths full of inventory get shopped more, so keeping it really full. Um, and then also making sure you've thought about the traffic flow for your customer too, that they can move around and they're not going to get stuck in a sort of dead end. Um, and for us, because of that sort of family atmosphere, I, we found that price points for products in that $35 to $75 range really do the best. It doesn't mean that we don't sell things for more, um, but that's, that's a good sweet spot for the, the kind of products that sell really well here. And again, here's some really nice booths. Um, nothing but a pigeon over there on the top left. They're, they're, that's an outdoor booth, so they've just really done a lot with their walls to hang their, <laughs> their crochetermy or whatever they call it. They have some silly name for it. <laughs> um, o Laszlo on the top right has uh, you know just that kind of stacked table risers to show product. That's obviously a, Good way to do it. Again, another outdoor booth, and it's working well in her setup. Um, uh, this was one of the very few exceptions when we have a booth that has to have lighting. We have a couple of outlets. It's just such an old school that if every outlet that was there was used, we've seen it overload the circuit. So we're very, very selective of who we actually give power to, but it's obviously essential for them. Um, <laughs> yeah. The, um, you know, I think it's nice even when it's just on a flat table to do some kind of creative displays for how you showcase your, um, your products. I, I like how they, you know, highlight their jewelry. Um, and Brian and BGA Craftworks always does a really nice job of, he's an indoor vendor most of the time, and he does a good job of his little separate, separators. He actually has little shelves built into them to display his vases. And, and Fisk and Fern is, you know, she's just like surrounded by her stuff and I really love her smile and <laughs> she, you know, she definitely has that good customer uh, service side to her business as well. Um, so in terms of uh, kind of some, <laughs> some parting information about some holes, so again, some opportunities here potentially for you guys. Um, we've had uh, some vendors that have come and gone, and some of these that I'm listing here are ones that are just not in business anymore. Um, but I am convinced, especially that first bullet, there's somebody in this town <laughs> that makes some like really custom cute pet clothing or hats or accessories for, for small dogs and cats. I mean, they would just sell a million of them. We routinely get this vendor, the cat farm from Houston that does like catnip toys and stuff, and she just does phenomenal, you know, every year. <laughs> Um, we also need a sort of a good knit hat, scarf, gloves vendor since it is winter show when it's cold out and people are out there shopping. I'm sure that would do extremely well. Chia Hats was like a cornerstone vendor for many, many years before she went out of business um, or, or closed down her business, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's very popular. Um, we, as I said earlier, we, we have a shortage of photographers that apply. Um, and, and I don't know if it's just because they're, if they're more of a fine art photographer, they're afraid they just can't sell at the show or something. But if they do those kind of smaller prints or cards or other things that you can buy in addition to their big um, prints, you know, I, I know it would do well. We just need a few more of them to apply. Um, we have baby clothes people, but I, more. We could get more. <laughs> and um, 
the last point is, you know, that kind of niche specialty gift, like I mentioned, Cat Farm does great with that. The uh, uh, Critics' Choice winner, uh, Illuminated Objects, that did something with Edison light bulbs. I mean, those were over $100, but they were really a great gift, very unique gift, you know? So those kind of um, vendors would be extremely popular, too. Um, just to kind of give a little plug again to why our show is so popular, um, we do get a lot of traffic for a two-day show. We get at least 4,500 people a day. Um, we show all those places on the website when you're an artist in the show. We have courtesy booth sitters to give you a break. As soon as we had a really cold winter, we instituted a uh, free coffee snack cart, a mobile cart, and like we could never go back because everybody loved it so much. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we have that move around throughout the show to give, bring you things. Um, we have a very well-stocked artist green room. It's in the teacher's lounge, which is kind of cute because you're like in the teacher's lounge. <laughs> um, it has food, beverages, private bathrooms, which is great. Um, we mentioned you on that, that booth map you saw is on a fair program. We have those promo materials we send out. And again, we have very reasonably priced booth fees. Um, we also started last year doing professional development workshops. And that's, again, sort of part of our nonprofit mission that we really want to foster artists, both emerging and artists that are professional artists that are trying to kind of bring their career to the next level. These topics are the four that we did um, this last year. I think some of them will probably be repeated this year, but we're trying to do it every other month. So we should have, you know, at least six of them in 2017. Um, and they've pretty much sold out and were very well received. And here's again just some quotes from some of our artists, <laughs> from our artist surveys and pictures to show how many sh shoppers are there and to get the sort of kind of fun feel about being in elementary school and the kind of stuff that's on the walls behind your, um, your fair stuff. We uh, like to get some of our performers to do sort of almost like a flash mob. We had the flamenco dancers take people through the halls. We had a brass band last year that did that. Um, we have real community, like real family programming. This is uh, the band show doing puppets um, with the kids coming up there. We have a great face painter who's extremely talented. Um, that's lots of fun. Um, here's like some of our outdoor booths. And again, another good quote. Um, this, uh, this is a long quote, longer quote here from an artist, but like she obviously had a really pretty amazing experience for her first year. Um, and, you know, we do, we do try to transform the school, and so we have things like that more art inside sign and kiosk and lots of decor everywhere to really make it feel like a holiday show. Um, here is the ever popular green room spread and the roving coffee cart, which we have some of the kind of neat things is our little artists, our fifth and sixth, sixth grade little artists are actually many of them have continued volunteering at the show like from sixth grade on you know now we've got some kids that are almost in high school that still do it year after year and they're really cute <laughs> um, and then again it's it's so popular I'm gonna keep emphasizing it that's like the menu of donated food that we got last year just to give you like a it's not just like carrots and you know granola bars it's like a really nice spread <laughs> Um, so our key dates, as I said uh, at the beginning, we have our applications opening on July 1st. Um, the deadlines are the 15th and the 1st, 1st being the final deadline, September 1st. Um, we take two weeks to kind of get through that jury process um, to notify our artists, and then we announce our confirmed artists right at the end of September. And this year's um, art fair is the 9th and 10th. So... I think that's it. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs>